Good morning, party people. Howdy, and welcome to another fun weekend. It was fun for me, at least. I have worked for seven days a week for, like, on and off for, like, the last couple of months. And so it's been kind of weird. That, like, I'll go through sprints and then uh, none, sprints and then none. Um, and when I say none, I mean, like, I disconnect and go somewhere else, like Malibu, California, or whatever. Good morning, Mossy, Mossy, Moss. And uh, uh, so I've had, uh, like today, I was kind of excited because I had a weekend emergency client scheduled and they canceled at the last minute. So now I get time off, oh, which is kind of awesome. Although I have work that I need to do that I owe Richie. Richie and I are working on SQL Constant Care and I owe him a bunch of things that I have to, to add and like plan out for the next round of improvements that we have to do. So now today I get to go sit by myself on my balcony and like go sketch out things that uh, we need to do for the next version of SQL Constant Care. Well, Lee, good to see you again as well. Um, and Mossy, 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 it was funny that um, uh, I was thinking of you this morning because I was like, eventually all of this quarantine thing is going to be over, and eventually we're going to have user groups and conferences again. And when we do, we are all only going to know each other by our Twitch and YouTube names, and we're not going to know, good morning, we're not going to know anybody by their real names, so we're going to need like t-shirts with our uh, Twitch names and YouTube names just because it'll be easier to recognize people by that. Like, I knew when Surly Dev and I met in person, I knew him from his shirt. Like, he had said that this is a shirt I'm going to wear. So I was like, oh, I know exactly who you are. Uh, morning, Neil. Good to see you again. Uh, welcome, uh, Kavishka. Yeah, Horace says, how do you wake up so early on holiday? I am hard-coded to wake up at like 3 or 4 in the morning at the latest. So usually, even when I'm on vacation, it's kind of funny. We often go to the same place in Mexico, and there I will wake up like 2, 3, 4 in the morning in Mexico when I'm on vacation. I'll go down to the, the there's like an oceanfront restaurant. I'll go down, sit down there with my iPad. And the people uh, actually, rec or actually recognize me because I'm down there every morning. And the cleaning staff will bring me out coffee. Uh, so, uh, so it's always fun to, to you know, be, like be that early in the morning for stuff. Uh, but then on the flip side is I'm dead at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. 1 in the afternoon, I want to take a nap. Um, SQL Dev DBA, what, one of the things I really wanted to do for this year's uh, Black Friday sale was I really wanted to get it so that when people bought a live class season pass or a bundle, that they would automatically get a shirt without knowing about it. Like, I just purely wanted to surprise them. But then I realized the sizing thing is such a pain in the rear. Trying to get a t-shirt size right, like this, this shirt, honestly, if we're being serious, it doesn't really fit very well. Um, but I love it because it's from the National Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, so <laughs> 2 a.m., yeah. Uh, but so then I was like, oh, what could I do? Could I do coffee cups? Uh, and then we've tried shipping coffee cups a few times. <laughs> Lycra, oh my god, is that, terif is that a terrifying thought or what? Good morning, sir. Um, no, oh, CGS too. We got Chris uh, in here this morning. All kinds of people. The man who knows things. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the things that I know aren't usually terribly useful. Most of the things that I know are pretty much uh, worthless. Uh, SQL Dev DBA says the shirt is actually pretty true to size. It's not bad. It just feels a little awkward in terms of how it's it's uh, just not quite cut quite right. It's not not terrible, but uh, nice. Um, these do stretch a little bit. These are uh, kind of a little bit uh, stretchy, but I love the National Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. is absolutely amazing. It's really cool. Uh, if you ever get the chance to, to use it I, or go to visit it, I highly recommend it. Um, uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, very cool. I, I always usually like to have them on my desk when I'm working with clients and drink from them. And they're like, Where, when am I going to get one of those, uh, one of those mugs? Um, so, yeah, so now I get to kind of goof off this weekend. So, originally, Originally, I wasn't going to stream either. Originally, I was supposed to work. Usually with my uh, weekend emergency gigs, I have to do some prep right before the gig, and then uh, we get on the camera together at like 8 a.m. Pacific. So that's true. I haven't gotten one of the tumblers yet. I have to go uh, buy one of the tumblers. I ha also have to get the jacket. I don't have one. Of I was going to order one of the jackets, and then I forgot. I should actually... Uh, Actually, I shouldn't take a note of that. I was going to take a note of that, so I did it right after the stream. But 
I think my wife is a little angry with me for the amount of shirts that I've bought over the last couple of weeks. Because like every quarter, I like to go buy a whole bunch of t-shirts for the streams, uh, mostly for the live classes, because I always think it's kind of funny when I show up with uh, different... Uh, no, exactly, Chris, you nailed it. Um, that I'd like to show up with slightly different t-shirts. And uh, I, I've already bought a whole bunch of t-shirts and my wife gets kind of upset when I get small packages repeatedly sent to the house because she disinfects everything, you know, because with the whole coronavirus thing. So we'll we'll leave the t-shirts, we'll leave all mail. It gets pa piled up in the window out in the sun. Uh, so then after the you know sun kind of soaks it in for a day or two and the you know virus has a little bit of a chance to die off, then she goes in there and you know scrubs everything down and disinfects stuff. So the more small packages that I order, the more pissed off she gets about having to disinfect all those things, which is fair because she's really just trying to keep me alive and I can't get, I shouldn't, you know, uh, I totally, I'm totally sympathetic. I get it. Uh, she's wonderful for doing that for uh, me. I love it. But I got to stop buying additional small things. There's so many little tiny things I want to buy. I need another camera. I need so many little things, but my wife will get upset. Sujith so says everyone has that Corona package corner. I wonder if I was wondering if if we were the only ones who did that, or if everybody else did that too. Like leave it somewhere in the sun for a while to just kind of disinfect. And at first, I told her I was like, you realize that it's just sitting inside, right? That like the if the virus is airborne, if the thing gets moved around. Uh, ooh, Merlin says, does new car qualify as small new thing? I was this close. I'll show you something. So I was this close to buying, let's pull it up. Uh, so Cars and Bids is Doug DeMuro's new car auction channel. Tehran, wow, very cool. That's awesome. Um, so let's see, Cars and Bids is this awesome auction site. And there was an auction this week. This, be still my beating heart, I used to have an Audi RS6 this same year. Mine was gray, and the, I I don't rec I don't um, regret a lot of things in my life. But one thing that I regret is selling that car. I had a gray Audi RS6. I had no need for it. I to be honest, I don't have a need for one car. I work from home. I don't work is even a stretch. Um, but this car, my goodness, it has so much power, it is ridiculous. At the time that it was released, back in 2003, it was the fastest sedan on earth. So you'd hit the gas pedal, boom, 186 miles an hour. Um, f around 500 uh, horsepower, 500 horse uh, pound-feet of torque. So much power that it was infamous for trashing its transmission. Used a Tiptronic, early version of the Tiptronic transmission, it would trash the transmission. This thing sold for 10 grand. I have no business with one of that. Now, CGS is who outbid you. I talked to my wife and I was like, so look, here's the deal. I really want this thing bad. And she's like, but you know, we're leaving to Iceland. You know, we're going to Iceland for three months minimum at the beginning of next year. She's like, so you would have to put this into storage. See, well, the MDBS is the RS6 Avant just hit the US Go Now. So I'm allowed to buy one. My wife and I have talked extensively about this. I'm allowed to buy one, but I would have to sell helmet. She says, you can only have one of those two. You don't need both. And I'm like, but, so I can't do that. But oh, what a beautiful, beautiful uh, car. And Farshid says we have to pay several billion dollar, uh, several billion tomans to buy this. Not only is it, it's, it's even, it's not expensive to buy. I mean, it's not terrible to buy, but the service is awful. So the service on this, because the engine is so crammed into the front, the engine, it's so big and they've stuffed so much uh, under the hood. Because this thing is so stuffed under the hood, if you want to have any maintenance work done on it, they actually take off the front end of the car. They take off the bumpers, all that stuff, in order to get to uh, all the components inside here. So the expenses is are absolutely insane. Merlin says that over here, the eco tax alone on a car like that is 40,000 pounds. Yes, yeah, oh God, crazy. So uh, I... <laughs> 
Er, 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 Eriker? Eriker Erickson says, which I just love that Icelandic names are just so incredibly cool with like the Erickson. And you may not be Icelandic, but that Erickson thing, it's, you know, of course, how they do it over in Iceland. Um, but Eriker says over on YouTube, what are you doing in Iceland for three months? Uh, as little as possible. <laughs> um, but what I'm going to do is get a, so we're working on a work permit and I'm going to work for a company over there plus continue to teach my training classes uh, and just go see the country again. So we went for one week, then uh, two years ago, we went to Iceland for one week. Then last year we went for one month. Then uh, this year we're trying to go for three months. Um, so I'm really interested in uh, playing around with that. Vital Freak says, uh, I have a small hot hatch in the workshop for transmission repair. I feel your pain. Uh, also, I have a company car. I have the same way. I really have no uh, need for that kind of thing. And uh, just see Chris says, will you adopt a cool Icelandic name? I had not thought about that, but somebody said that uh, Bert or Brent translates to burnt in Icelandic. So I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, so Sukvir asks a question actually, and I'll answer this one. Do column store indexes help on update queries? No, they're actually terrible. Update statements are one of the big uh, problems with column store indexes. Under the hood, column store indexes really treat an update as a delete, then an insert. So now that, that's not really that big of a deal because with column store, you can do your own delete and then insert, and it's not really that bad in terms of performance. But updates, for some reason, the way that they implemented updates are terribly slow. So when I talk to people about whether or not it makes sense to put column store indexes on your tables, one of the things that I'll say is if you're doing updates, you probably shouldn't do that. Uh, Gad over on YouTube says, when do you start with the Calm Store Indexes videos? The course, the first live course is Tuesday, if I remember right. I got to actually go look at my calendar. I'm not even sure. Um, so my calendar, let's see here. It is, yeah, Tuesday. Um, so Tuesday will be the first Calm Store class. Then the instant replays of that will be for sale on brentozar.com. Um, Andy says, sometimes I drop column store indexes, then update, then re-add the column store index. Yeah, absolutely, because it's, it's actually faster for some kinds of tables and the number of updates that you're doing. It can actually work up uh, quickly. Eric says, you can help with the Icelandic. Oh, I, I'm going to need that so badly uh, because Icelandic, Santa says, are you learning any Icelandic at all? It's so interesting. And several, feel free to ask technical questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put those into a queue and I'll answer those those two will go through and all the technical questions or non technical questions you want to ask today is uh, totally cool. So with Icelandic, here's a deal. Right now, Americans can't get into Iceland. Um, we can't get in on a tourist visa, but we can on a work visa. So I'm going to get my, uh, we don't even need a tourist visa, we can just show up over there, but the problem is you can't do the coronavirus thing. Um, so what I'm going to do is get my work visa, and if I get a work visa as an expert, which is, I always have a hard time saying that with a straight face, I get a work visa with an, as an expert, and then I can bring Erica along with me. Um, so we're going through this background check process and all kinds of cool stuff. The, if you're in Iceland for four years straight on a work visa, then you can apply for permanent uh, residency. Now, normally, four years straight in another country is not something that I can really do because, of course, we have clients, conferences, trips I want to go on. But you know what? I'm not going anywhere for a while, so it might not actually be that bad. So it's kind of crazy to think that I would go over there. And if the situation with the coronavirus continues in the United States, which I have no reason to believe it wouldn't, it doesn't look like we're really close to a vaccine anytime soon. It uh, doesn't look like we're going to get out of quarantines anytime soon. State of California doesn't even have a timeline. <laughs> yes, it did. So it's, there's a funny story there too. On Andy, I'll tell you that one privately. But my mind check passed okay. Erica's did not, um, which I knew about ahead of time. Which we all had a big laugh out. Which is funny because she's been an air traffic controller. She has all kinds of federal clearance and stuff. But she's like, that. There's the thing with the place. Um, 
but if you're over there for four years and you want to apply for permanent residency, um, you have to learn Icelandic. You have to take 150 hours of classes on Icelandic. So I go and read, or I'm starting to read about, okay, so what is Icelandic? I don't really like learning languages, but I find so much about Iceland charming. I'm like, oh, let me go see if, uh, you know, what it's like to learn Icelandic. Oh my God, it's terrible. It's so hard. They have like 14 different tenses. It's insane. It's one of the, I was like looking at it, and it's the most complex language I've seen. And it's not really that useful outside of Iceland. But I don't do anything halfway. Like, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to own the bejesus out of it. So I'm like, well, if I'm there for a year, I am going to learn Icelandic. But we'll wait and see how that goes to see if I actually stay there for a year. Um, and Ganesh says, are you going to Iceland for work or holiday? Yes. <laughs> so I'll, because I can work from anywhere, we'll, do, uh, we'll work like two weeks a month and then do the rest of the two weeks a month running around the country. Because it's just gorgeous. It's the most beautiful country I've ever seen. Uh, just spectacular. And I'm not going to get out of the United States. I love the United States. It's amazing. It's fantastic. The people, the, the geography, uh, the opportunities, the food, the cost of living, you know, the, the space for cars. I love the United States. It's fantastic. I would recommend anyone, if you get the chance to visit, it's magical. The problem, of course, you can pick the wrong cities to go visit. You wouldn't really want to be in some cities for an extended period of time. Some spirit cities are less tourist friendly than others, but damn, it's a, it's a wonderful place to live. Um, so it's not like I'm going to get away from the United States. It's just that we really like Iceland too. We like all kinds of places. Uh, and GovDBA says living there will help with the language. A lot of people just speak English. I've, we've never, we've even gone to a very tiny, uh, lots of very tiny places in the middle of nowhere, and we've never had a problem. So, uh, Dtovi says, don't you think Europe has a greater variation than the U.S.? No. Um, having been to both, I think that Europe, in Europe, there so much has a really long history. It's been there for, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years in different pockets. So it, it's very similar in that the culture has, has bred through the area. People who are in Europe are very used to and tolerant of other cultures, so there's a lot of mixing and matching. Whereas you come to the United States, and it's so young, and certain pockets of the country were only inhabited by certain cultures, that it's just dramatically different between... Mississippi, Louisiana, Florida, Washington, New York, just spectacularly different. Ariel, sure, absolutely, by all means, go right ahead. It's, uh, that's how I make my living. All right, so let's go copy-paste some of those questions into the queue. And then, so let's see here. I'm going to copy these in. You're about to see all kinds of stuff uh, show up in the chat. Uh, let me go copy some stuff in here and copy, copy, paste, and then next up, let's copy another one from over there. Oh, Erica said, what company will you be working for? I'm not ready to announce it just yet, um, but I am so excited about it because it's just so uh, neat. I just love this uh, company. Um, so let's see here, copy that in, and then copy this in, and copy this in, and this, and what else? Did I get everything else? Is that everything? I think I got them all. Uh, oh, Mazima says, yesterday I finished reading one of the books you recommended, T-SQL Fundamentals, and today I started with T-SQL Querying. Yes, that is uh, Itzik Ben-Gan stuff. Absolutely wonderful. I really enjoy that. Okay, so Erickson st says starts with an M. No, I almost guarantee you've never heard of it. That's the other thing that's really neat about this. So I had a bunch of Icelandic subscribers, and I just emailed them all, and I said, hey, you know, if you're interested, here's what the engagement would look like, you know, work with you this many days a month and so forth. Um, and it was totally... Uh, uh, the one that emailed me, I was totally surprised by. I had never heard of the industry before, and I adore it. It's just it's eco-friendly, and it's all kinds of really neat things. Uh, so let's see here. Let's start going through. We'll add that. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so SFD, I did get yours. That's good. So I've got that there. I'm going to copy-paste 
that in and then we will go start running through these. So first up we have, I should actually take a sip of my tasty beverage here before we start because I have a terrible habit of making espresso and then not drinking any of it because I just get so excited. Next, or first up we have, how do I remember how this works? It's been so long. CTI Geek uh, on Twitch says, I've heard never to use where not in and instead use where not exists. Do I agree? You know, it's really funny. I had never thought of where not in. Um, like it, that never even occurred to me to write. That is so weird. Because I've never, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that I've never thought of that or seen that. That's kind of intriguing to me. Um, but where not exists will bail as soon as it finds the first row that matches. Um, my guess, and I'm just guessing, I'm guessing that where it's where not in will execute the entire result set before it checks for existence. I am just literally guessing, though. That's probably why. Um, so that would make sense to me about uh, existence checks there. Next up, uh, SFD says, what are your thoughts on using merge in 2019? Is it safe? No. Sadly, merge, all the bugs that you've probably heard about from merge are still present. I'm going to go pull the post just so that you can see it. So if I search for merge Aaron Bertrand, Aaron Bertrand out of New England has this blog post over at MS SQL Tips where he goes through all of the bugs inside the merge statement and the current status of those bugs. And the short story is it really doesn't make any sense to use that uh, particular statement. So when you want to find that, search for merge Aaron Bertrand. Um, also, folks, only ask your question once, please. Don't put it in multiple times. If you put it in multiple times, I'm just going to ignore it altogether. So, all right, there's the first one. Let's come back over here. Next up, we have Kavishka over on YouTube says, Hi, Brent. I work as a junior DBA for a year, and I love performance tuning. I invest a lot in learning. Is it a bad idea to bet my career in a niche field so early on? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, Buck Woody, and I, I know it's not his original line, but he's where I, I heard it first. Buck Woody likes to say that in a mature market, in a mature product, you want to be a specialist. So like a product that's been around for 20 years, like SQL Server, it pays to be a specialist, to do a very deep dive. In an immature market, things that are newer and changing a whole lot, Azure, Amazon Web Services, etc., Azure Data Factory, Power BI, in an immature product, be a generalist, like be able to do anything. So because you're working in SQL Server, it totally pays to be a specialist. If you're able to establish a reputation as a performance tuner, it's fantastic. I would highly recommend it. And it's also one of those careers that continues to pay off as people move to the cloud. The cloud is not self-tuning. The cloud is almost self-harming, and it is extremely expensive to get high performance in the cloud. So it, that's a great career. If you love doing it, you should totally go for that. I can't go for that. Oh, uh, no can do. Um, so Andy links to my my uh, the book that I co-authored. I almost called it my book. Um, someone said, uh, uh, I didn't catch who it was, but I saw it going by. Uh, Brent, would you ever think about write, uh, writing a book? The problem is that books make less money than minimum wage. Uh, so it, for me, I like money. I like money a lot. Here's to money. So... The thing is, people just seem to kind of pirate books these days. They just copy-paste and send them around, so it's kind of tricky. All right, next up in the queue, next one, Barris says from over on YouTube, Brent, what would you do if you can't use instant file initialization on SQL Server other than upgrading to a faster disk? Um, some people uh, will, or some companies will not allow instant file initialization because it's a security risk. In the kinds of shops where you're not allowed to use instant file initialization due to the security risk, you probably have all kinds of other handcuffs and barriers too as well. 
people think they're like, well, I have to be able to use this feature, you know, when the security department says no, this is what enterprise development is like all over the world, that enterprises constantly say, no, you can't have that cool feature because of the security risks. And you just have to learn to deal with it by going with faster hardware. Just that's all it boils down to. Now, one thing that I would be aware of is the restores are slower because restores have to write out the entire contents of the data file and log file. Restores are slower. So one way that you work around that is you pre-restore databases ahead of time using things like log shipping so that if all hell breaks loose, you've already got a restored copy ready to go. Next up, Dtovi asks, I would like to alter a dev database and see if the changes make things better or not. Is query store the easiest way to correct, collect production queries to replay in development? That's a really good question. For me, I don't usually collect queries from production. I, I talk because of my weird consulting role, because I have to do this exact task a lot. What I'll usually do is say to the client, give me five variations of this query, like five sets of parameters that you want me to tune for. What are the ones that are most important to you? Query store collects things that users may or may not care about. For example, they may be things that are run by a back-end service, things that, uh, that aren't user-facing and that aren't critical in terms of performance. So if I used query store, I would use it, but then I would sit down with the users or whoever the performance stakeholders were and say, all right, which, out of these, which ones do you want to see me focus on? Because you're always going to have crappy queries. The thing with query uh, store is it can bring a server down if it's not used correctly, if the workload is bad. So if you use query store, just make super sure that you go watch Aaron Stellato's course on Plural Site. If you search for SQL Server Query Store Plural Site, she has a course over there, and that's really the only good resource out there in our industry right now on the breaking problems with Query Store. I've had clients bring servers down with that repeatedly, so I'm to the point where I. I won't recommend Query Store unless I can be there to be involved in the workload when the thing gets turned on. Other options, my personal favorite for that is the plan cache. So I just use SP Blitz cache, which has no additional overhead on the server. Your server already has the uh, plans up in cache anyway, so you can just grab them anytime that you want. Next up, Jignesh says, Hi, I have a hybrid environment with Azure. What connection method can I use? I'm getting lots of ODBC connection failures. So generally, if you have your, your database servers in one place and your application servers in another place, that's going to introduce a lot of latency. You're going to have a hard time connecting between those because the connection will drop all the time. You'll have uh, uh, contention on that network pipe you want your applications right next to the database server, like uncomfortably close. There's no worries about coronavirus in between the application servers and the database servers. You want them holding hands, making out in the parking lot. You want them that close. Um, so generally, I just wouldn't try to do connections between those two and expect them to always work. Uh, let's see here. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm an angry gumball. <laughs> I love that name. That's so awesome. I'm an angry, angry gumball says, have you ever had a customer refuse to move their databases off of optical drives? So I think what you might have meant was magnetic drives, but optical drives are generally read only. You know, you can get RW uh, drives. Um, but true story, I did have to actually deal with that very early on in my career. We actually ran stuff off of uh, big CD jukeboxes. We had giant optical optical jukeboxes with, yeah, exactly, worm drives, where we could write uh, records and then never worry about someone erasing them. So we, we did have to deal with that. And I can tell you horror stories about the time when we only had four drives in the entire, it was like this jukebox the size of a fridge, a pioneer big monster jukebox. And we had little robotic arms in there that would move around and swap the drives in and out. We actually couldn't get the drive arms to move fast enough, pulling the little worm drives in and out. What a hot night nightmare that was, but the CEO got a really good deal on the drive, so whatever. Next up, 
Ed says, is there a big performance difference between having the default incrementing primary key, like in an identity integer, versus a string primary key, like username and SQL in general? The reason why people usually like small columns like integers is those clustering keys are included in every non-clustered index that you have. So the wider your clustering keys are, the more space that they take up, they're going to take up that same space over on all your non-clustered indexes too. So it makes your non-clustered indexes larger. Now, is there a big performance difference? You'll find armchair architects, people who don't really build anything these days, who just read about it in books, are like, well, it's a, it's really important, it's a big, ginormous difference. But I tell you what, I've never had a case where I went to a client and said, you know what, your biggest problem right now is that you're using the wrong data types on your primary keys. And this changing the data types on the primary keys is going to be the solution that gets you across the finish line. Because changing your clustering keys generally sucks pretty bad. So I'll say is, when you build a new table from scratch, yeah, you want to pay the attention to the clustering key designs. But hey, let's not ask questions twice. Remember, we're, we're only going to ask them once. Um, so ju just generally get it right when you go build a new database, but don't try not to go build uh, or try not to change it on an existing database. Just the overhead generally isn't worth it. And generally, you'll get more bang for the buck by chasing something else. Next up, um, Vital Freak says, any risks, any risks Turing, like Alan Turing test, for query optimized error fixes on server wide with 4199? Uh, so, are there any risks? Anytime you turn on a trace flag, you're going through a less documented and less tested path through the SQL Server code. I'll be honest. I don't even trust SQL Server's defaults these days. I don't think they're doing a good job of testing what comes out of the box, let alone when you turn on trace flags. Great example of it is how they recently last month had to pull Cumulative Update 7. They were like, OK, everyone, you should patch with this immediately. Two weeks later, oh, you know what? I did, it, 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 it turns out we didn't test that. I, we need you to roll that back immediately. And I'm like, uh, that, how about you get your pants on and start testing things first? So the, the, the gotcha with that, with turning on trace flags, is that they're not testing those worth a damn. So for me, I don't want to turn on most trace flags across the board. I'd rather turn them on for specific databases where they desperately need it. 4199 is a great example of that. I would want to make doggone sure that it's going to make things better instead of worse. So for me, that's on the database level all day long. And then next up, Lee says, I set up my first SQL Server failover cluster recently. I assumed that there would be an event for AGs. I was surprised to learn that nothing like this events. How would you recommend alerting for an FCI failover, a third party app? If something is important enough that you're going to put in a failover cluster, go buy a monitoring tool. Go buy Quest Spotlight, Idera SQL DM, Sentry One Performance Advisor, Redgate SQL Monitor. Like all those people have figured out how to do not just that event, but so many more that SQL Server doesn't handle uh, by default. So just go do one of those. Otherwise, trying to build your own monitoring, you're always going to end up behind. You're always going to end up behind the eight ball on that. You don't want to look stupid. You want to look smart. And the easiest way to look smart is just to rely on somebody else for stuff like that. It's only like a thousand bucks a server. Leave it to the consultant to say something like that. But if it's important enough to cluster, when I'm sketching out the costs for a budget for a new project, I just include the monitoring software as part of that. And if somebody wants to, to uh, bend on... Uh, 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 like worry about uh, costs on the project, I'm like, how's about you take off one core of licensing so that at least I can just get the uh, monitoring software working? Because I would trade one CPU core of licensing for a complete monitoring solution all day, every day. So there we go. Uh, all right, let's grab uh, the next round of questions here. Actually, while I do, I should give a shout out to, that's the wrong button. That's the wrong button. That's the wrong button. 
give a shout out to this week's sponsor. This week's sponsor is the Data Platform Virtual Summit. So this is a conference that's happening in December that's got a different kind of time schedule where it's actually friendly to people all around the entire globe. And they have pre-conference workshops and post-conference workshops. Right now, they are 50% off if you use the coupon code up there on the screen, DPS SQL. So over that's over at dataplatformvirtualsummit.com. I'll leave that up for a second while I go copy-paste in your questions from over in YouTube to get those things all queued up. So you're about to see a whole flood of questions come through here. So let's see here. Let's copy-paste this stuff inside here. Add this, add this, and add this, add this. Uh, ta -da -da -da. <laughs> uh, copy this in, and then do 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 do. Next up, let's grab these over here. Oh, that no, that's Twitch. Let's see here. Let's copy this in. Copy. Buckle up, because now the stuff is going to come in like crazy. Do do do. Uh, copy this in, and this. And then this, and this, and oops, uh, so that DTLA that was a good one actually. Let's get make sure that that's in, and do 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 do. Copy this in, copy that in, copy this in, and that. People are like, how boring is this? Um, Oh, LTTF, I didn't copy this one. It uh, says, thoughts on SQL Server serverless? Uh, yes, uh, I like it a lot for dev databases that can just power down overnight, so that's kind of cool. Um, let's copy that in. Boy, we, oh my goodness, I don't think we're going to need any more questions today. We have so many questions in here in the queue uh, that I may not need to hit any more of them, actually. Um, copy this in and paste. And I think this is it. Let's make sure. Whoops. Paste this in. Any back up on YouTube? Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. So Jith has a good one there. Uh, and that's it. Okay, perfect. There we go. And then add. Do, 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 do. Add, 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 add. And, and I should have music on when I'm doing this. Oh, Andy Leonard says I'm speaking at DPS. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, there is a good lineup of speakers, too. All right, let's come back over here for this. <laughs> there has to be a theme. There has to be a name, behind, an idea behind that. Eeyore, be, go beep, beep. That's such an excellent... Your beep, 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 go beep beep says, I tuned a query in which the reads and writes dropped CPU at 95% in dev and then execution time increased uh, and the DBA is refusing to release it. Should execution time ever be considered when run in a radically different uh, environment? Oh, totally. Yeah, so I'll give you a great example. So I was tuning one query and it ended up, after I got done tuning it, it ended up using way less resources, but it went from going multi-threaded like going parallel across a whole bunch of cores down to going just to one specific core. Oh, it's Surly Dev show up. Oh, there he is. Woohoo. Oh, awesome. Ah, I didn't know he was in here. Welcome, Surly Dev. Thank you. Um, so the query that I was tuning went from going multi-threaded down to just single-threaded because SQL Server believed it was so much less work. Um, so because of that, the uh, it actually made more sense to go continue tuning it to figure out how to make it go multi-threaded so that I could still continue to get the time down and have it use less resources. So absolutely, because at the end of the day, execution time can be the customer-facing experience. Uh, sometimes we have to make them both better, not just one side. But it's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, and Surly Dev, I want to give a shout out to Surly Dev who manages the questions in the queue. Thanks to Surly Dev for being uh, today's moderator here. That's actually, that's awesome. Yeah, Adam's absolutely right there. Completely true. Next up, Peter says, should views which have a big amount of joins, let's say 20 plus, be split into temp tables or CTEs? 
So with views, you can't use a, a uh, temp table. So that, that doesn't really work. What I would sometimes say is if you're having performance problems with a query that hits a view, sometimes you need to refactor it into using things like temp tables. But what I'll say to users is, yeah, by all means, go ahead, use the views as starting, because most of the queries that you write don't actually need to go that fast. But when you start to hit a performance wall, bring me the queries that are having the problems. Then we'll talk about re-architecting those in a way to make them go quick. But by all means, if you want to use the view as a starting point, go right ahead. If you find yourself going, this one view always sucks, then that's when it's probably time to step back and go, OK, how could we either change the indexing uh, on the underlying tables, or maybe even consider uh, an indexed view, which materializes it to a disk. Next up, uh, long1231 Twitch says, hi, Brent. Some of our tables are rep some all our tables are replicated. That's interesting. Here we go. Um, when any column changes, we have to manually drop the indexes in the replicated tables. Is there a better way to do it? I hate replication. I recognize that it is something that the world needs and that lots of people use it, but I can't stand the damn thing because it's really a pain in the rear to manage for things like this, for deployment changes, uh, changes to tables and columns. So I don't actually work with replication at all. I think the last time I worked with replication was 2008, maybe. So I'm not a good person to answer that question. But I'll tell you that it is a good question, that people struggle with that all the time with replication. And you said, is there a better way to do it? Usually for me, the better way to do it means switching to things like always on availability groups. But I get that that's a problem because readable secondaries are enterprise edition only, that they copy the entire database across, that you can't have different indexes. They come with all kinds of challenges, but they work. So next up, uh, Ima says, if the server's been up for long and we don't see any reads in DMDB index usage stats, can I say the index is not used? For me, for long is usually 30 days. If a server's been up for 30 days, then I'm reasonably confident that the index isn't being used. You just have to be very careful that if someone has an index hint in their query, that query will fail when the index isn't there. But generally, as long as the server's been up for at least 30 days, you're good. Uh, Sukhvir says, good to see you again. Sukhvir says, we have a table of less than a million rows, and we have a process that does upserts on the table, which locks it. Right now, we do a synonym swap. Is there a better way? Yes. Search for, so you're, you're doing upserts. I would do it in batches of, say, 2,000 rows or less. If you stay below SQL Server's lock escalation threshold, which is about 5,000 locks on the table, if you nibble through it in smaller numbers of rows, like two, 3,000 rows, then you can avoid lock escalation and you don't have as big of a problem there. It, plus, it's not going to require the schema uh, stability lock. Um, it's going to not require the schema stability lock that the synonym swap would have. Next up, uh, Kevin DBA says, do you have clients who have troubles running the consultant toolkit? I think it's straightforward, but when we end up having to do a screen share with them to get the output, you know, I'm going to tell you something funny. Having clients use the consultant toolkit is kind of the minimum barrier for entry for me. If someone can't get that to work, I kind of go, you know what? You're not really a great client for me because that utility is so relatively easy that I go, if you can't pull that off, I'm probably going to get frustrated working with you because you probably made other really unbelievably large mistakes. So I feel you, Kevin, that you're generous enough to do the screen sharing time with them. If there's something that you think would make it easier, shoot me an email and we'll definitely see what I can do. But like, I don't run into that that often because also too, my, my prices are kind of high. Um, DTL says, downtown LA says, what Brent, what auditing product do you prefer for tracking changes to data? It, for me, the question becomes, do you need to stand in court and defend the data that's inside the audit? 
So I have some clients who do. Some clients, they have to keep legal track. And I'll give you a great example, hospitals. If you're a hospital, you have to track everyone who sees George Clooney's medical records. Because if they go and sell them to TMZ, you have to be able to prove who did it. And it has to stand up in a court of law. If you have to stand up in a court of law, I punt it over to the security team. The security team should own the auditing appliance. Um, the database administrator shouldn't have any rights to it whatsoever. And there are appliances that sit in between the SQL server and the rest of the network, and they capture every network packet. If it doesn't have to be legally defensible, I don't really care what we use. I'm a big fan of triggers, just because inside a trigger, I can pick and choose which kinds of changes I want to capture. Whereas with tools like change tracking and change data capture, they're going to go grab all kinds of stuff that I don't really care about. And sometimes when I'm doing it for just my own diagnostic purposes, a trigger is much lighter weight. Uh, next up from YouTube, Sajith says, do you recommend turning on accelerated database recovery for a highly transactional uh, databases? So that's a new feature in SQL Server 2019. And since it came out, there was a corruption bug with it. I get a little nervous anytime Microsoft changes something involving the storage engine inside user databases. So I don't recommend turning it on unless you're having a performance problem that that's the only way you can get past it. If you're hitting a, a problem that you can't fix any other way, then sure, but the rest of the time, yeah, exactly. Adam says, anytime anything goes magically faster, I wonder what the trade-off is. And here, this is a brand new piece of code. Now, Microsoft is using this up in Azure, so I'm sure they're finding and fixing the bugs just as quickly as they possibly can and shipping those back into the product. But, um, And I, I, I'm a huge fan of the feature. I'm a huge fan of the idea. I love the way that it was implemented, but it's just risky. Anytime you put in a change, change equals risk. So don't put it on unless you have no other choice. Steve says, is there, over on YouTube, Steve says, is there, are there any places for failover clusters today or have availability groups made them redundant? So imagine for a second that you're a software as a service provider and every client gets their own database because this makes sense for a bunch of reasons for some industries, like when every client needs to be able to grab their databases to do a restore, or you need different flexible performance and indexes for different clients. So if every client gets their own database, it's not unusual to see SQL servers with 500 to 1,000 databases per SQL server. Availability groups suck at that kind of thing because they use uh, CPU threads in order to move data across replicas. Plus, you just doubled the size or tripled the size of your storage depending on how many replicas you have. Uh, so there's still a huge place for failover clustered instances. Uh, yeah, there, there are a whole lot more cases for it, so that's the answer in on that one. Good question, though. Um, this hey, Masi Moss uh, asked this one, and I wanted to go into deeper on it, so I copy pasted it into the queues. Masi Masi Moss says, uh, "Did you think about writing a book, something like irrelevant, irreverently fast T SQL? Not from scratch, but I'll tell you what I do have in my back burner. Um, I've got a, a big long list of things that uh, that I want to do someday when I have the time. It's like someday maybe kind of thing. Um, one of them is I have an editor that I've worked with in the past that will take a whole bunch of blog posts and turn them into a book. I want to do that with like, with Brennozar.com is coming up on 20 years next year. Like the 20 years worth of blogs. Now, obviously, the stuff in the first five years is not very good. Um, but after that, I mean, uh, uh, there's plenty of stuff in there that I'm like, oh, I'm really proud of that. Or other people, Jeremiah, Kendra, Doug Lane, you know, all these people have written, Eric Darling, all these people that you've known and loved, Richie Rompos, Joris, woo. Um, so I want to make sure that uh, I get those back out there. I would do that. I would do a best of Brenozar.com, but I would totally give it away as cheaply as Amazon will allow me to give it away because I don't want to get rich on that kind of thing. There's no money in books these days. I have no idea. I don't even know what that is. Next up, um, Ragu says, I haven't seen you talking about latches and spin locks for query tuning. Does SP Blitz uh, cover them? So I have never personally hit a problem where spin locks were the root cause. 
So because I haven't hit it, I haven't needed to build any of the code into SP Blitz, Blitz Cache, etc., Blitz First, whatever. Latches, I absolutely have, and SP Blitz First starts to dig into those. Uh, and I'm not saying spin locks don't exist. Spin locks totally do exist. I just have had the weird random luck where I've never had to uh, problem solve those. So I'm an angry gumball says, what happened after five years that instantly made the blogs better? Um, I want to say it's Stephen King that says when you write, you, part of the work that you do in writing is you have to sit down at the, at the typewriter or keyboard every day and you just have to push stuff through. And the more that you write, the better you're going to get. I got a lot better after the first five years, but I just didn't know what I was doing or why I was blogging for. <laughs> a lot better. And I haven't gotten any better since then, but whatever. Samiro on YouTube says, is a query performed using SP Execute SQL going to perform the same plan as just running the query of the string? If not, why not? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, so generally speaking, it's going to be the same. There are edge cases where it'll be different, but generally speaking, it's going to be the same. So I'm going to give you an example of why they might be different. Whenever SQL Server builds an execution plan, it's like opening a choose-your-own-adventure book. You remember those from your childhood? You would open up the book, and it would say, if you want to slay the dragon, turn to page 14. If you want to rescue the prince, turn to page 21. So when SQL Server opens up this choose-your-own-adventure book, it's up against the clock. It needs to ship an execution plan and start running your query. Well, depending on things like statistics, how much time other users are burning on CPU, you may hit a query that gets different execution plans depending on when you execute it, like how heavily overloaded the server is. And I'm not talking about the query having different, the, the lights are actually on, they're just not bright enough in here. Um, so the so the query will get uh, different execution plans depending on uh, how much resources are available to SQL Server at the time of compilation. That is a very edge case answer, but it's I feel like I need to say that because there are times where there will be a difference. Next up, Alan says, Hi Brant, I watched your live tuning video the other day and I was surprised that windowing functions perform so poorly. Could you shed some insight into why? The easiest way to do that is go read Itzik Ben-Gan's book, T-SQL Querying. So search for T-SQL Querying, Itzik Ben-Gan. It's a wonderful book that dives into how you craft windowing functions, among other things, all kinds of other stuff, uh, for best performance. I want to say it's like 860 pages, so it's pretty pretty in-depth and thorough. Obviously, I don't want to go into that on a Q&A webcast like here, but I want to get you at least a place to go start it. Um, next, Eriker from Iceland says, uh, have you looked into the scalar UDF inlining issues in SQL Server 2019? When that was my very favorite feature in decades when it came out, I was so uh, in love with how Microsoft tried to do it, it so ambitious. Um, but also it was kind of doomed because it's people will put the most nasty stuff inside their scalar functions. Um, so I dug into it, but the problem that we've been hitting is that with every cumulative update, Microsoft has been pulling functionality out of that feature. So I have a hard time recommending to clients that they put something in when 30 days from now, the part that made their queries faster could be yanked back out. So if you can use it and it helps your queries go faster, great. I just wouldn't bet the farm on it right now. I'm kind of holding out for version two. I think whatever the next version of SQL Server is, we'll have a better idea of whether this is a feature that Microsoft will continue to invest in and fix the bugs in or if we have another merge statement on our hands where they brought the feature out and then they went, oh, actually, as it turns out, not so much. Gopi says, hi, Brent, are 10 indexes on one table okay? What you want to do is you want to check out my upcoming Fundamentals of Index Tuning class, and it's totally free. I'll show you how to sign up. 
So what you do is go to brentozar.com, go to brentozar.com, and then right up at the top, it says free live fund. God, that guy's big. Uh, free live fundamentals class uh, coming up. Click on that, and you can go attend an all-day class completely for free that will teach you how many indexes on your table is okay and how you go about working with those. Also have a day-long fundamentals of query tuning class and a class on how I use the first responder kit. All of that is completely free. I'm doing free training during a lot of the quarantines. As a spoiler alert, that's mostly going sucks so <laughs> oh, i'm strange um next up santa asks uh do you have an opinion on peer-to-peer -peer replication as in do not use it unless absolutely necessary yeah that, so my thing is if you really want two active sql servers that are both hosting inserts updates and deletes into the same table um, i don't like peer-to-peer -peer replication as the solution because you kind of have to work within its framework what i'd really rather have is just a bunch of separate sql servers and we roll our own uh like conflict resolution Solution so that I can have help desk people do the conflict resolution uh, for me instead of me doing it myself. I, to give you a rough idea, I worked with a team that did that on, this back when I was a real DBA, uh, on seven to 8,000 SQL servers, servers that were installed on salespeople's laptops, and we had to do with, uh, deal with resolution conflicts. So for that, anytime I'm going to go start building peer-to-peer -peer solutions at scale, I'd rather roll it myself than rely on what Microsoft has built in. Not that what Microsoft soft built-in uh, sucks. It doesn't suck. It kind of sucks. But they're just not improving it. They just haven't done anything to improve it in 15 years. Because it really does work well enough. It works well enough for most people. But if you're going to go push it at scale, that's where you're going to want your own complex conflict resolution. Uh, let's see here. Next up. Oh, Erica said from over in Iceland, Erica, <laughs> I'm probably going to say that every time now, said, I've seen up to 30% difference when changing from big int to int in very large databases. What you want to do instead is just implement compression. If you implement, I can't, I want to say it's row compression. If you implement row compression, then SQL Server just automatically only uses integer sized columns if it's integer sized data. Like for all the ints that you have, you're only going to use, I forget if it's four bytes or eight bytes. Um, it's going to use the smaller size, and only when your data crosses into big int territory does it use the rest of the space. So the reason why compression is so much better of a solution is you don't have to change your data types, you don't have to alter the existing tables. And all you have to do is do an alter index rebuild, and you've immediately got it. Okay, look, the, the drawback is that you have to be on Enterprise Edition to get that index compression, if I remember right. Uh, but you, when you say very large databases, they're probably on Enterprise Edition anyway. So that's a really fun trick there. Next up, GMA's DBA works for Good Morning America. I don't, I don't really know that. Um, I recently received an offer to a database administrator. Oh, that offers adult entertainment website services. How is having a resume in that seen in the fields? Should I try and hide it? No, 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 no. Here's the deal. I say here's the deal a lot. With adult entertainment website uh, businesses, you're going to learn about very high volume OLTP with interesting challenges, like they want it to be highly available, uh, they are handling e-commerce, security and privacy are a big deal. So depending on if it's like a name brand adult entertainment website, it's going to actually have some recognition in the field of, oh, that is, you know, a high volume big deal. I say that because gambling is the same kind of thing. I have clients who are gaming uh, companies. Th th usually they will make you sign an NDA that you can't name what the company is. And Adam says, yeah, there are multi-billion dollar companies at this point in those industries, some of them at least. Now, of course, they also get hacked from time to time and you don't really want your resume attached to the company that got hacked. But what I would say, if you don't want uh, people to uh, look down on it on a resume, 
is say, uh, come up with a say, I worked in media, I'm not allowed to name the company. Because sometimes people will have NDAs where they're not allowed to name the company that they worked with. <laughs> I'm an angry gumball says, yeah, you don't, you don't really want to see how the sausage is made though. And there are multiple meanings of sausage. Uh, but it's, it's really, that can give you wonderful experience. Um, and everybody needs IT. I mean, it's the same thing for a while. Cigarette companies or tobacco companies were looked down on in America because, you know, technically the product kills people. You know, it doesn't really have a whole lot of positive uses. Uh, but everybody needs database administrators. So if if you need it and it lines up with your career, I kind of jokingly say that if I ever retired and the mafia, like if I was sitting on the beach in uh, Mexico and the like, one of the drug cartels came up to me, put a gun to my head and said, uh, you have to do our database administration, I, I wouldn't like it because I don't ever want people to get hurt. But at the same time, I'm also kind of interested because I'd be like, all right, so how do they use SQL Server and how does that all go on? Uh, that's very true too. Santa says that everything is all gaming now these days. Uh, Richie asked, why am I here not watching European football? That is a very good question. I think Erica has that on her schedule to go uh, watch uh, today. Oh, th that's good. PA, uh, PA points out, look at all the marijuana dispensers and growers. That's true because sometimes things will be illegal and then mor morals will change and then suddenly it's legal and everybody's into it. I'm not into it weed. I'm ambitious. I have things to do. I don't really have that many things to do. Ashish says, all our tables are replicated with custom replication. Nice. We have primary keys with GUIDs, which causes page splits. Eh, not so nice. Um, can we add date as the first column with GUID to avoid page splits? So the problem is, whatever your clustering key is, that column is going to get added to all of your non-clustered indexes too. And if you're just adding a date column for the purposes of having a date column, it's just going to add more baggage to all your non-clustered indexes. So I'm not really a big fan of that. I don't really have a problem with most page splits because after all, you probably have indexes on columns that are going to have page splits. I'll give you a great example, customer name. When your customers sign up, they're not signing up in alphabetical order. They're signing up with names all over the place. So it doesn't really make sense to like desperately avoid page splits when you're going to have them on all your non-clustered indexes anyway. It's not really that big of a deal. Uh, so a quick shout out to this week's sponsor. So this week's sponsor is the Data Platform Virtual Summit. You can go learn about their co conference lineup over at dataplatformvirtualsummit.com all kinds of pre-con and post-con workshops so you can get a day of live training with instructors from all over the world. Check out that lineup over at dataplatformvirtualsummit.com and then right now you can use code DPSSQL to get 50% off the cost of conference admission. Um, this is one of those deals where you, I don't know how long that thing runs for, but if you're going to use it, go talk to your manager on Monday about how you can go get into there because I don't actually know when the expiration date on that thing is. All right, so let's take a bio break here. We're going to take a five minute bio break, and when we come back, I'll keep working with the question queue because y'all have so many good uh, question uh, questions out there today. So I will see y'all back in here in five minutes. <laughs>
<laughs> Welcome back, party people. Uh, yes, I am totally in the cloud today. This is funny. We have a uh, total fog in San Diego. We had this yesterday, too, in San Diego. Um, and it burned out fairly early on. It's the, air, the flip side is the air quality index is amazing. It's like 38 right now, which is kind of odd because it's, you know, you'd look out and it's the fog. But it's, 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 at least it's not smog, which is kind of cool. Uh, over on YouTube, Anaket asks, I like that name too. You always have cool names. Anaket asks, uh, can change data capture cause incremental backup sizes to be large? Um, you know, I have no idea. Um, I haven't used, when I went through the Microsoft Certified Master Program in like 2008, at the time I, I had never used CDC or cha change tracking or CDC. Um, and I, I learned what I learned about it just inside that class in like a two hour module. And then I don't think I ever used either of them again. I don't think that they're bad. I, there's nothing wrong with them. Just I don't have any experience in the intricacies of it. So I don't actually know. I'm just going to say off the top of my head, anything that, that writes to the database can cause your backup sizes to be larger. So the more that you track, things like change tracking and change data capture are logging things. But I don't know. if I, That wouldn't be my first guess, though. That wouldn't be the first thing that I would guess would be causing it. So next up, oops, BW Merla, uh, Merlin says, tips for non-DBAs who look after SQL Server. By far and away, the biggest tip that I can give you is go run SP Blitz. And I'll show it to you. <laughs> So if you run SP Blitz, this is an open source, totally free stored procedure. You can go Google for it, and I've got a download link to it. It's all open source, licensed under the MIT license, so you can use it at your day job. It is a totally free health check in priority order. So you can walk right through and see, here are the priorities that I need to work on first. The most urgent stuff pops up first. And if there's anything that you don't understand, Adam says, I'm afraid to run SB Blitz because there are some nasty things going on. <laughs> That's what you call consultants in for. And you know what the consultants do? They run SP Blitz and they just copy paste it into a report. I know because I get emails all over the world uh, from consultants who say, thank you for doing this because I make a living just running SP Blitz. And it's true. And to some extent, so do I. Uh, so if you uh, then, if there are any warnings that you don't understand, you can copy paste inside here and you can go learn over in a web browser, here's what that means. Um, generally, I kind of jokingly say that stuff from priority one through 50, uh, with the numbers over on the left-hand side, priority one through 50 is generally the reasons that people get fired. Now granted, you're not gonna get fired for tempdb on a C drive, but when that thing fills up and the OS won't boot, that's when you start to run into problems. So just f the stuff from priority one through 50, go learn about those and start to fix those. I'll tell you what, Merlin, if you do that, you're better than most database administrators I know. I would think, I, I give this away for free. It's all open source. I would think that if people are going to hire me, they would Google my name. And if you Google my name, say my name, say my name. If you Google my name, this is one of the things that comes up. I would think that people would go copy paste this, they would go run it, and they would go start working through the stuff. But you know what? Most of the time when I go to work with a client, I run this and they learn stuff. And they're like, oh my God, I didn't know I had some of my databases uh, not backed up. I didn't know that we're not doing CheckDB. Um, so Chris says, what are you doing in that company? It is unbelievable how often I run across this, even from clients who I've worked with for years, that I come in once a year or once a quarter and they are surprised every single time I do that. I'm like, it's, this is free. It doesn't even cost anything because I don't want you to pay me huge money and all of a sudden I show up and all I do is run SP Blitz and I'm like, yo, your pants are unzipped. So I don't really want to see your junk. It's smaller than you think it is. That makes me sound like I see a lot of junk. I guess I kind of do. Um, so next up on the list, next up, Kavishka says, if you could give yourself advice back when you started your career, what would it be? Don't spill espresso on yourself while you talk. Mm. What would it be? I think 
I, I like I'm overwhelmed with the number of things that I would want to tell myself as I was younger. For example, um, when you have an opportunity to learn more early on, if you get the chance to to work somewhere fun where you can learn things, don't worry about the money when you're young. The time to make money is in your later 30s, early 40s, later 40s. Don't worry as much about money in your 20s and early 30s. That's the fun, experimental time of your life when you're going to have enough energy that you can do all kinds of crazy things. But later on, as you get through life, you're going to have more commitments to other people. You're going to have more. <laughs> yes, I'm an angry gumball. Remembers that story. That's, that's a very funny story. Um, and, oh, Mike, that's yeah, good to see you. Um, as you and Mike, Mike will identify with this as well. As you get older, you're going to have more commitments, and you're going to want to commit yourself to people, not to companies. Like the older that I get, the more that I want to spend more time with the wonderful folks who are hanging out with me. Hear me on uh, hear me. See, I can't even string three damn words together. The nice folks who hang out with me here on Twitch. Um, it's more about uh, people. <laughs> That's true too. It turns out that man's a murderer. Uh, th there are there are things that you have a lot of time for when you're young. Don't feel guilty about that. So, like I grew up during the dot com days, and I had friends who went off and became billionaires, and I felt guilty. <laughs> I felt guilty for not doing that. Like there was a time in my life where I was like, I suck. I wanted my, my grandparents, uh, specifically my grandpa on my mom's side, retired when he was, I want to say 45, like he was 45 years old and he'd retired. And I kind of looked up at that. And at the time I knew my grandpa on my dad's side, he was also retired. I kind of looked up at that and I went, I, wow, these people are doing it right. I need to do what they're doing. And to do it that way, I would have to jump on a treadmill and start running like hell. I didn't do that. I chose to goof off a lot. I chose to, to do a lot of interesting things that didn't make much money. I traveled all over the U.S. When Erica and I got together, we traveled all over the world. And I felt really guilty about that because I wasn't making a lot of money. If I could go back and tell myself, my younger self, I'd be like, you go girl. You know, you do uh, all of that that you want to. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Man, I get so many interesting uh, technical problems that I made. From a career perspective, what advice would I give myself? Um, I would say go work for companies where you can learn and don't feel bad about that. Just because you're loyal to a company that a, that a company has good people doesn't mean it's good for you personally. You may need to be challenged more. I, I stayed with some companies longer than I probably should have because I, I loved the companies what they did and the people that I was with, but I wasn't learning a damn thing. So I was kind of treading water for like a decade. Next up, oh, I would also say that uh, I dropped out of college. Don't do that. I, I dropped out of college three times. And, uh, don't do that. Next up, Santa on YouTube asks, a query runs okay, not great. When compatibility is level is taken up to the max possible, the CPU blows up. The query uses row over. Any thoughts? Yeah. Compatibility level, especially when you jump from uh, a, a jump into 2014. So as soon as you get to like compatibility level thing, I want to say it's like 120. Um, as soon as you go to 120 or higher, you're getting a different cardinality estimator, which gets you differently shaped execution plans. Y you have a choice of either you could leave the database on compat level 100, which is still available in SQL Server 2019. Or you're going to have to tune queries differently when you get to compat 130. At 120, 130, you know, on a 2017, 2019, all that stuff. So if, if for some business reason you need to change your compat level, just change your compat level and expect that every query that used to be fast is now at a risk of maybe going slow. So... And don't don't change the compat level for no reason. If you don't need to change it, leave it exactly where it is. If it gets you the performance that you need today, leave it. And there's nothing wrong with that. People think that they're missing out on something magical. All you're missing out on is bugs. Microsoft hates it when I say that. Um, next up, let's see here. Ian says, what are your thoughts on open query versus querying a view on a remote server? 
In either case, when you have one SQL Server talk to another, performance is going to suck. One of the reasons that it sucks is that SQL Server doesn't cache that data locally. It assumes that something might have changed on the remote server, so it'll go, wow, that's a, a nice name there. Um, you thought I was a queen? Psych. Um, so the SQL Server will always go and fetch that data from the remote server. That's a recipe for a bad time. So if you're a developer and you're writing something that needs to go get uh, data from a SQL Server, go connect to that SQL Server. Like if I wanted to ask you a question, I wouldn't write it down on paper and hand it to a friend of yours. The friend of yours is going to take longer to get the data. Just go connect to the data server that has the data that you need. I know that's the kinds of things consultants say. Alex says, I read great things about SQL Server 2019 and Kubernetes. Have you seen anyone using Kubernetes in consulting gigs? Oh, here we go. I sure have in order to make more money. Have I seen them use it to solve a client's pain? No. That's probably where I should leave it at that. Uh, Luco says, any recommendations of SQL Server free courses? Yes, if you go to brentozar.com and search for free training, I have all kinds of them. Or if you go to our YouTube channel, so you're on my Twitch channel right now. If you go, <laughs> that's true, yes. If you go to my YouTube channel, search for Brentozar YouTube, I have hundreds of hours of free video on uh, how the engine works, statistics, tuning queries, you name it. A lot of the streams are, and I break stuff into categories, a lot of the streams are me answering questions. Don't watch those to learn things because it's kind of sc shotgun scattered all over the place. Watch the ones that aren't Q&A, and there are hundreds of hours. <laughs> Psych Queen says, glad I stumbled on you because my husband uses SQL Daily and this husband or this channel helps him learn new things and I love collecting knowledge. My wife kind of jokingly says that she could be a database administrator now because she's overheard me talking on so many training calls and consulting engagements, so it's kind of funny. Oh, thanks, Adam. I appreciate that. That's very cool. Next up, Et says, I need to store a resource key from an external API. You know what? My audio isn't going out. Y'all aren't hearing the sound effects. Let's go fix that. Sound, and then change that to loopback audio, and let's try that again. Yes! Yeah, there we go. That works better. Ed says, uh, so add, how, I need to store a resource key from an external API. How would you recommend designing the tables using a composite key or the key given by the API as a primary key? Any, so this goes true for APIs, human beings, any database you will ever design. This is a big, important career lesson. Talk about things that I would have told myself when I was younger. When someone tells you that something is going to be unique, they are lying incorrect. They just don't know it yet. They don't know that at some point they are going to send you duplicate, redundant, uh, uh, exactly the same copied data. That was me trying to make a joke on duplicate and redundant at the same time. Um, so I would never use a key from an API as a primary key. Somebody's going to change that API. Somebody's going to have a bug in that API where it sends you dupes. Never, anytime someone tells you something's going to be unique, don't believe it for a second unless it was generated by your system, by a system that you own. And even then, it's probably going to give you dupes someday. Uh, oh, uh, Santa says over on YouTube, if someone was to migrate from SQL Server 2016, uh, would you, I, Andy, I knew you were going to like that. That was really funny. Uh, how would you, would you recommend 2017 or 2019? 2017. For me, and I, I haven't written a blog post about this yet, and I'm kind of torn about it, but for me, the, the code quality on 2019 isn't there. Like the, the number of updates that are coming out are fair. I don't have a problem with that. The bugs that they're fixing are fair. I don't have a problem with that either. But the quality of the updates has been so bad, and there have been so many questions about it, that at this time, I can't in good faith recommend SQL Server 2019. 2017 is bulletproof like a freight train. That thing is fantastic. If I was going to pick a version, even between 2016 and 2017, I'd take 2017 all day long. It's pretty awesome. I, it doesn't have that many gains over 2016 in terms of performance type features, but it's just reliability. It's uh, kind of cool. 
Next up, Roman asks over on YouTube, what would be the best strategy to keep table variables in memory as much as possible? What's the problem you're trying to solve? Tell me more about the problem you're trying to solve, because I think you're jumping into the wrong tactic. There's this, this thing called an XY question. I only learned about this recently, so I'm going to tell you, because you might find it interesting too. There's a thing called an XY question, where when someone asks about X, what they're really asking about is Y, but they just don't know that yet. The, the reason why you're asking about something, how to keep table variables in memory, A, I don't think you should be using table variables. B, if you're trying to keep them in memory, remember that you're shoving other things out. You're shoving out cached data. Oh, very good. Oh, nice. I haven't seen that one. I'm going to have to look at that. Um, you're shoving other things out, and you're thinking that you're outsmarting the SQL Server engine about what needs to be in cache. Erica is exactly right. They're not memory bound. Almost nothing in SQL Server is guaranteed to be memory bound. And I know that someone's going to pipe up and say, you should try in memory OLTP. Hell no, you should not. Because the problem is then you need like twice as much memory as you have in memory OLTP data. So I get really nervous about that kind of thing. So let's zoom out a little and tell me the pr business problem that you need to solve. What is What are the users coming to you saying, I need help with this? Because I guarantee you they're not saying, Tab I need my table variables to be in memory. Zoom out. What's the problem that they're trying to solve? Ask that and I may be able to get you a better answer. Uh, Gumalari says, I need to copy database backup files to multiple servers. Can you, uh, uh, can you uh, suggest to me the best possible way? So I would, because copying files around is something that Windows does really well, SQL Server doesn't really do that kind of thing, what I would do is I would write my backups to a network share and then have all the other SQL servers pull directly from that network share. If you need to copy that network share to multiple places, you hand that off to your Windows team and you say, I need every file that gets landed here to be copied over there. And your Windows admins are used to doing stuff like that. They have to do that same problem for all kinds of servers. So they'll use tools like uh, Windows DFS, rsync, uh, xcopy jobs. They'll have all kinds of tools at their disposal. But as a data professional, don't get involved with that because that's not you're not going to do a good job of that. I'm not going to do a, a good job of that. I'm an angry gumball, says Windows team. That's a thing. There are so many jokes there. Uh, DB says, the server I work on has more than four terabytes of memory. Is that a lot? It asks, it kind of comes off like you're trying to show somebody your junk in a park by opening up a jacket. None of us are impressed with your junk. Besides, we know you're just making numbers up. Next up... Beater says, dumb questions. <laughs> it's like, wait, oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, says, dumb question, is there a way to no lock a procedure or view rather than no lock on each and every table? Yes, I'll show you how you do it. So if I want to write a stored procedure that has no lock on absolutely everything, I'm going to pull out a stored procedure that I just happened to talk about, SP Blitz. So let's go open SP Blitz and let's see what it has inside of there. So right up at the top here, there is this line, set transaction isolation level read uncommitted. This is the same as putting with no lock on every single query that you have. Now I know some of you know me and you know how I feel about no lock, that it gets you random data. That's okay for this, because for this, it's mission critical that I don't block anything. I don't really care if I give you wrong data inside SP Blitz, because let's be honest, you're not fixing the problems inside here anyway. So it doesn't really matter what I show you, you're not doing what you're supposed to. Sometimes I say things out loud, I probably shouldn't. But anyway, so this is the way that you do that. This is the same as putting no lock on every single table inside there. Next up, next up says, oh wow, Samson on YouTube says, in a job interview, if you were asked to explain on your last project, how deeply will you explain? Or what are the things that the interviewer is looking for? What an, interview is looking for, an interviewer is looking for is they want to know how you can help them. So what I would do is, as soon as they were asking about the project, I would start describing it in big terms. 
specifically about the business. Okay, so the business was really frustrated because the performance on the website was taking a really long time. They believed that the problem was a database, so they had me make the database go faster. And I would immediately, as soon as I'm done with that sentence, ask the interview, is that the kind of problem that you're facing here? And the faster that I can turn it on them to get them to talk about the problems that they're having, the easier it is for me to come back with, oh, I had a problem just like that. And let me tell you how I solved that on that project. The answer that I'm giving here for the server I was working with may not be the same problem that you're having, but I want to tell you how a time where I had a problem like you're having and how I solved it. This gives the interviewer more confidence that you are going to help solve their problems too. So as fast as you can, pivot into, tell me about the problems that you're having, and I'll tell you about a time when I solved it. Next up, um, uh, Surly Dev says, says, asking for a friend of a friend, do you run CheckDB on a database or on a restored cop, uh, copy of that database? When, when I can, I like running on the, the main original copy itself, like the production copy. The reason why is, Almost every time that I've seen someone offload CheckDB onto a restored copy of the database, they've had bugs in their script. They had bugs in the restore job. They had bugs in the CheckDB job. One of my favorite examples of that was I had a client who was doing the restore and CheckDB thing, and they'd been doing it for years. And I said, because I, I don't believe anything, I'm like, okay, so show me. Let's, let's go in and look at the logs, because I want to see the last time CheckDB finished successfully. And they're like, oh, here it is. It's in a table. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's go look in the event log. Let's go see when it failed. And the deeper that we went into there, they're like, oh, yeah, we're restoring this uh, 15 terabyte database and running CheckDB in two hours. And I'm like, no, you're not. Two hours doesn't make sense for that database size with the contents of those databases, something smells odd here. Show me. Let's see the logs. And so as we were going into it, they were running out of space during the file copy and restore process. So it never actually overwrote the oldest copy of the database. They were every day running CheckDB on a database from like two years ago. And of course it was succeeding because they were checking the same damn one every single time. So then their eyes all get big. And I'm like, well, just, just don't, anytime you have a process, don't take for granted that it's got success messages in the log and that means you're okay. Dig deeper. Just dig a little deeper now and then and see why it's wrong. So that's why I prefer doing it on the primary because then it'll actually update the last good CheckDB in date inside the database, and then we all have warm, fuzzy feelings. Uh, it's not that I never do it on a restored copy. I just prefer it on the main copy first. Um, so Manny, I'm not actually going to answer that question. So if you want, you can Google that one. There's, that's pretty easy to Google. Sherrod says from over on YouTube, what's the one feature in SQL Server in the last few versions which has made a lot of difference in its performance and scalability? Ooh, um, column store. Column store. So when column store indexes came out in SQL Server 2012, they were a hot mess. They made your table read only. But this is one feature where Microsoft kept investing every year, and every year it got better. It ain't perfect yet, still has a lot of gotchas, and I talk about that in my Fundamentals of Column Store class. But man, I tell you what, it makes an unbelievable difference on big multi terabyte databases. Just fantastic. Uh, next up, Juwan from YouTube says, do you prefer triggers, CDC, or temporal tables for logging? I like, if it's logging for my own purposes, like for the app dev team's purposes, I prefer triggers. Uh, and Manny, I'll teach you about that in my fundamentals class. Watch my fundamentals of uh, Column Star class. Uh, I prefer triggers because I can tune what data I capture and log and how I log it. Because sometimes I don't care about logging every uh, column. Sometimes I only care about uh, logging certain columns or only certain contents of certain columns. So triggers help me do lower overhead logging. Um, plus, often with CDC and uh, temporal tables, they capture everything. And then I have to go through some other mechanism to pull the data to the place that I want it. 
So I prefer triggers, but I don't have any hard, passionate feelings against CDC or temporal tables. Also, too, just in terms of logging, I, when people think they want logging, what they often do is they log everything and then they keep it like a hoarder, like their apartment is chock full of all this garbage, useless data, and they never go back and fix it. So triggers are just a little way that I can lower that overhead because once people put in CDC or temporal tables, then they gather everything in their databases like 10 terabytes in size. Next up, Ganesh asks, the SQL Server service stopped when we were getting data from open queries. Um, it worked when we ran under SA account after, can you share info? So let me, re let me generalize your query a little bit. The SQL Server stopped what should we do about that? So anytime the service stops, I, I want to jump out and ask, what were we doing at the time? Is there a better, faster way of doing this? Um, my worry with things like Excel and Open Query is that somebody's trying to pull the entire contents of the database out, and they may run wild and crazy queries while doing it. In a lot of shops, they actually forbid using things like Open Query because it is such a performance uh, pig. So if I was going to share info, the first thing I'd say is, let's not have Excel connect directly to a production SQL server. Let's find out what data the users need in Excel, and let's use a tool like SSIS or SSRS to pull that data out on a fast, efficient way and leave it for them on a file share so that they can go fetch it from there. But generally, I'm, I'm not a fan of having tools like Excel connect directly to a production database because they just don't perform very well. Next, DB asks from YouTube a great question that comes up all the time. Does it ever make sense to create an index on a temp table? This is kind of political. Most of the time when I see people creating an index on a temp table, it's because they think they need it, not because they actually need it. So the times where it makes sense for me to create an index is when I have a big long stored procedure, I'm going to say like a thousand lines long, and it repeatedly hits the same temp table on the same columns. My first question is, why are we doing it that way? Is there a better, more efficient way of writing that code? But if there's not, if we need to over and over again hit the same temp table with the same filtering columns or joins, then it makes sense to do an index. But if you just load the data once and pull it back out again, you don't really need an index for that in most cases. It's not really going to help that much. I just got to pick my battles with clients. So sometimes I'll go into a shop and I'll, I'll see people with a bunch of indexes on their temp tables in every stored procedure, and I'll just be like, okay, I'm making a note. They're not wearing pants, or their pants are on their head. But I'm, I'm going to pick my battles, because usually winning that battle is kind of tough, and it involves breaking people's hearts. Next up, Tabibi says, is there ever a good reason to restart SQL Server other than for applying patches? Yes. So if you make a big dramatic change to your application, you deploy a new version of your application, for example, and you want new metrics across the board, including index usage. Right now, the only way to reset index usage statistics is by restarting the SQL Server instance, taking the database online or offline. So if you want everything to start again from scratch after a deployment, a restart is one way to do that. There have also been a lot of cases where SQL Server had a memory leak. So that would be another one. If you can't patch to fix it, you would restart SQL Server rather than patching it. Do I understand Spanish? Uh, un poquito, uh, pero no, no más. Uh, <laughs> uh, mira, el diablo, estás en mis pantalones. Um, Surly Deb says, uh, the server I work, oh, we talked about that one, so I'll close that uh, little guy. Next up. Ariel said, uh, hi Brent, in the last webcast I asked you about min server memory equals zero. I didn't find a good reliable source. Do you know any? Sure. So... <laughs> As I told you in the last webcast, go here to brentozar.com, and up at the top of brentozar.com, I want you to click on scripts. Up there at top, click on scripts, 
And then right here, there's a download of my first responder kit, and it includes things like a SQL Server setup checklist. And in there, I tell you how to set up your SQL Server. So there you go. You can go get that. And that's a source I kind of like a lot because it's my source. <laughs> Next up, let's see what we've got here. Next up, um, uh, oh, Monty says, uh, will a column store index be efficient when a filter condition is there? Absolutely, that's what uh, why t some of the things that I teach over in my Fundamentals of Column Store class. And next up, Kurt says, a friend asked me to ask you about your thoughts on DBCC Optimizer, what if, to see how hardware changes might impact execution plans. So my thing is usually uh, it's hard for me to get clients to make hardware changes unless they're in the cloud. But if they're in the cloud, it's cheap to go build a giant monster SQL server quickly, and it's, it's stunningly fast. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So if I go to ec2instances.info, ec2instances.info is where you can get the costs of different uh, VMs. You can choose what columns you want to see inside here. So for example, I'm going to say, don't show me the Linux costs, just show me the Windows on-demand costs. I can say I want to see servers only with at least 60 cores and at least 200 gigs worth of memory that have at least 2 terabytes worth of storage on there. And then I can sort by the number of cores, the amount of RAM, all that stuff. And you can also change the cost to say daily. So just to pick one, I'm going to pick the i3 Metal. i3 Metal has 64 cores and 512 gigs worth of RAM and a ton of local solid state storage. And it's only 200 bucks a day. So if somebody wants to run an experiment to see how much faster their queries will go, I just go, all right, here, let's just go uh, spin up a server in EC2 really quickly. And for 200 bucks, we can run a day's worth of experiments, and I can show you exactly how your execution plans will perform differently, and you'll feel it because you'll see how much faster the query goes. For me, Optimizer What If doesn't do anything because if the client's just looking at a different plan and they're like, okay, the, the plan looks different. But whereas here, inside here, when I can actually spin this thing up and they see the difference in speed, that's how people really love and appreciate the difference in hardware. It's so much easier now with the cloud. <laughs> All right, next up, let's see here. Oh, it says my deck is currently empty. Oh, all right, uh, let's see here. We'll add a couple of into here. Do, 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 do. I think that's it. Let's go pop that one in. I am an angry gumball, says, uh, what's your favorite fast food joint and what's your favorite item from there? I have so many. Uh, I really like fast food. I'm a foodie, but there are a lot of fast food things that I like. And I'm going to give you just like a mental highlight reel of some of my favorites. Carl's Jr., uh, their $6 burger. I love that because it's called the $6 burger, but it's usually like $4 because it's just kind of funny. Uh, Jack in the Box, their patty sandwiches are absolutely fantastic. I didn't hit the clear queue button. I'm just working all the way through. It might be eventual consistency, but I'm not seeing anything in the queue there. Um, uh, the, so the, the Jack in the Box, their patty sandwiches, like sourdough patty sandwiches. Checkers, their French fries. Checkers French fries are fantastic. Chick-fil-A, a.k.a. Christian Chicken, their breakfast uh, biscuits are awesome, and so are their chicken sandwiches. Popeyes, I know that there was a bunch of buzz around Popeyes and their chicken sandwiches. I don't think they're any good. I think they're they're terrible. I don't think they're uh, good at, at all. Um, uh, Burger King, I like their fries a lot. I also like their Whopper. I think it feels like they use better vegetables than a lot of other places. McDonald's, a double quarter pounder, love that. Um, my wife likes the French fries the best from McDonald's. I'm not actually, they're okay. They're consistent at least, but I think if you had me name my favorite uh, French fries, they were going to be checkers. Sonic. Uh, Sonic drive throughs they're tater tots. See, like, I have this just ridiculous encyclopedic knowledge. But you know what I won't say is In-N-Out burgers. I think In-N-Out, which is huge in California, In-N-Out, I think it's terrible. I, don't think they, I think their burgers taste like cardboard. I don't think they're very good at all. But 
So there you go. Wendy's. Uh, Wendy's has a whole bunch of good stuff. Jack in the Box egg rolls are fantastic. Their breakfast uh, tacos, their taquitos is absolutely fantastic. It's just absolutely amazing. Oh, Erica says, have you tried the Icelandic hot dogs? Yes. And also... Um, so there's so many things that I like about Iceland, uh, Iceland food. The Lebowski Bar, Lebowski Bar in downtown Reykjavik, I absolutely love it. I know, I'm, I'm in trouble for dissing in and out. I, I just don't think that's good. I've tried it like five times. It's Taco Bell. Okay, so Taco Bell, their seven-layer burritos. I loved their seven-layer burritos. They're off the menu now, but uh, oh, so good. Why is this thing not showing any? Because I know Surly Dev is putting uh, stuff in the queue, but it's saying your queue is currently empty. That's really weird. Nothing's showing up is on deck. That's just odd how that goes. Um, so if you want, Surly Dev, if you want to try uh, putting stuff into the ticker, give that a shot, and let's see, um, let's see if, uh, if that works, because it's not showing anything up on, uh, on my side there. Uh, well, we do it. Uh, 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 I'm an angry gumball says my choices for lunch didn't get any easier. Oh, uh, Cure Bell says, oh, see, there we go. Now all of a sudden they're showing up. So now I'll go. Erica said, did you see any difference in performance between EC2 and Azure? Yes. For me, uh, Amazon typically has better VM options quicker. Um, a Amazon will offer better VMs, faster CPUs, better storage bandwidth more quickly than Azure, like they get there a year or two ahead of Azure. Azure eventually catches up, but for me, it, I never get to pick the cloud provider anyway. The only thing that I get to, to do is choose the VM types for the SQL Server. Because I want the company to choose, whoever the client is, I want them to choose their cloud partner based on the other solutions that are involved, not just VMs. Because really, at the end of the day, everybody's got VMs. That's not that big of a deal. But if you want something special like, and I'm going to give a couple specialized examples, if you want uh, Redshift, then you're going to be an Amazon customer. If you want Azure Synapse Analytics, you're going to be a Microsoft customer. If you want deeper integration with Visual Studio, you're going to be a Microsoft customer. Um, if you have an enterprise agreement with Microsoft, you're going to be an Azure customer. Um, if you prefer a lot of open source stuff like Aurora Postgres, you're probably going to be an Amazon customer. Yeah, I, I don't really care either way. I'm fine either way. To me, it's kind of like the old Dell versus HP versus uh, Lenovo type server discussions. I'm like, whatever you buy, I'm, I'm cool. Uh, Surly Dev says that in and out Burger sounds like an indictment on the quality, not a brand. And I, yeah, I kind of have that feeling. It's, it's kind of, they have a sharp sign, but I, the food's just not that good. You watch is always, you know, as a consultant, you know, I always, always have to be mindful that surely there's probably going to be someone who sees this and plays it to people who are the database administrators at In-N-Out Burger, and I'm never going to get them as a client. That kind of sucks, but at the same time, so does their food. So, uh, Prakash says, hi, Brent. How can one have a sense of humor like yours with SQL Server? It makes learning it more exciting and interesting than the current approach. Thank you. I appreciate it. That's uh, very cool. Um, a lot of it comes with, I got started in the, the hospitality business. I got started working in hotels and restaurants. And if you want to learn customer service and talking to people, there are few jobs that will make you better suited for that than working the front desk of a hotel. I'm going to tell you a story. So when I was uh, fairly young and working the front desk of a hotel, I worked for a hotel that was so bad, one wing of the hotel was basically condemned that the city wouldn't allow us to rent that wing of the hotel. It had Some of the rooms had no working bathrooms. None of them had any air conditioning whatsoever. Uh, they didn't have screens on the windows. So if you open the windows, you know, hello, bugs. But our city, small city that I lived in at the time, had a really big tourist event once a year. And once a year, it was the air show in Muskegon. Once a year, the city was packed. So many people would come in with their families and they wouldn't know that there weren't going to be uh, hotel rooms available. So here's what our boss told us. We had a slimy boss at the time. The boss said, whatever you rent, those, dis those condemned rooms for out of that wing of the hotel, I'll give you 50%. You can have half of the revenue. But they, if they get a refund, you're not getting any. 
Boy, I tell you what, nothing lights a fire into you like when you're working the front desk. Because I knew I had to get people to sign for it, and they had to stay. So I had to say things like, all right, here's the deal. We have no rooms left. There are no rooms left in the city. You're welcome to call whoever you want. I have a room. It has no air conditioning. It has no bathroom. There's a window you can open, but there are no screens, and there's no fan. You're going to be hot. You're going to be pissed. But if you want it, I'll sell it to you for 150 bucks. But I'm going to need to say, we're, I'm going to write it right on this piece of paper that, we're, that I'm writing on the checkout. You have, I understand that this room has no air conditioning, no screens on the window, and no bathrooms, and I will not get a refund. And they would sign it. They would take it. And sometimes it was more than that. Sometimes it was more than 150 bucks. And this is like 20, 30 years ago. So people would go to that room, and if they came back and they wanted a refund, I'd give it to them because I don't really care. I don't, you know, at the end of the day, I don't want them suing or something like that. But a lot of people would go there, and they would be pissed, but they would deal with it because they had no other choice. There was like no other rooms for 50 miles. If you want to learn how to talk to people, putting yourself in a situation like that, yeah, exactly, there was no Travago. And even if there was, there was nothing you could do. There were no rooms available for, you know, 50, 100 miles. Um, so that will really teach you how to relate to people. And that was, uh, that was just a wonderful experience. And you can laugh and have fun about it when you know that it's coming. It's when you have to do that as your job and you don't have a choice. That's where it kind of sucks. Darman says over on YouTube, what are your thoughts on a six terabyte database with premium disks? Should we take the effort? No, it makes no difference uh, whatsoever. Premium disks are junk. They're just garbage. You have to stream or you have to uh, stripe 10, 20, 30 of them together in order to get the throughput that you want. You will make no difference whatsoever with the 4K versus 64K allocation units. The easiest way to test that is to go provision another Azure VM with the same exact uh, performance. It's only going to cost you a couple hundred bucks to go do it for one day. Restore the data, you know, format the drives with 64K, restore the databases onto it, run a few queries, you'll notice no difference. Doesn't make a bit of difference. Scott says, hi Brent, I have a 10 terabyte database with uh, 10,000 tables. Do you have any guidance for partitioning CheckDB to work and avoid the last CheckDB never? Yeah, so what you can do is check out Minionware's CheckDB. <laughs> So if I search for uh, Minion CheckDB, Jen and Sean McCown have this open source free product that will help you restore your database onto different servers and break out CheckDB into different parts. It doesn't have a GUI. It involves T-SQL uh, in order to set the whole thing up and uh, like it's all table driven for configuration. Uh, as a disclaimer, I've never used it because I just, I haven't needed to. I do things slightly differently with clients in terms of that long story. Um, but I'm okay, I like I would try, try that in, a, I would try it in a heartbeat if I were in your shoes. So that's Minion CheckDB. Totally free, it's uh, knock yourself out. Next up, let's see here. Uh, Kirabell says, how is the market for a SQL Server DBA right now in USA? The easiest, so I can't tell you personally because I have a weird job as a consultant like, everyone knows my name. I can get work in foreign countries quickly. Um, Ariel, we're not going to have that discussion again. Thank you for understanding. So it's inside that, ch that checklist. If you ask me again, I'm going to ban you on the channel. So please understand that and hear me hear me once and believe me well. Um, Kira Bell says, uh, in terms of how is the market for a SQL Server DBA right now in the USA, the thing that I would say is, uh, if you if you talk to any of my clients who are looking for database administrators, for the longest time, for like 10, 15, 20 years, people insisted on the DBA being in the office, that they had to show up in there and be personally accountable. And of course, the virus changed all of that. So now companies are really shifting gears like crazy, trying to change their hiring practices because some of them are totally embracing the remote only uh, work. Um, others on them are still trying to think, well, we're going to hold off on hiring until we can get back into the office. Uh, but for every one of my clients who's embraced their remote only work and they're willing to hire DBAs from anywhere, they're still having a hard time finding the best candidates. I literally got an email yesterday from one of my clients who need, who's hiring a DBA right now. They have a stack of 100 resumes, and we're going to have to figure out how to get through that stack to find the right one. 
So they're overwhelmed with applications, but they're just most of the clients or most of the applications just aren't any good. They're people who want to get their first DBA job, for example. Next up, Manny says over on YouTube, if multiple sessions run my stored procedure, it takes 30 seconds. Uh, if I run it for a single session, it gets executed within three. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I, oh, there are so many. Uh, so I actually do. Uh, so only for my existing clients. So um, there's so many things to go and look at. It could be a memory uh, issue. It could be a CPU issue. It could be a, a storage is overwhelmed issue. It could be a tempdb issue. Go to brentozar.com and click on at the very top. I have a free set of classes running the week after next that'll teach you the fundamentals of query tuning and how I use the first responder kit. Go through that and you'll start to get a handle on getting the answer to that question. But very good. Uh, Fabiano near zero, just absolutely near zero. DB says, is it safe to install all your SP Blitzes on every server? Can I get in trouble by installing them? Yeah, you can always get in trouble for installing anything because some companies have security standards like where they'll forbid open source. I've seen clients where they say uh, they don't allow any open source stuff on their SQL servers. So, of course, you'll want to check with your systems administrators, your security team, etc. Next up, Benjamin says, is it dangerous not to encrypt SQL TDS connections? How often do you encounter non-encrypted connections? So um, if someone gets to the point where they can sniff your network traffic going between the SQL server and the application, if they can sniff the network traffic you generally have bigger problems because there are probably other unencrypted routes between the two. However, I'm going to give you a link to a video. So if I search by groupby.org, Pedro, oh, what's Pedro's last name? Um, there is a, it's not Pedro Lopes. Um, let's try secure encryption and security. Let's see if, nope, it's not any of those. Let's try youtube.org or youtube.com. Um, and let's see, group by, uh, oh, dang it, he's from Portugal. Uh, encryption, let's try that. Um, it's not that, it's not that. Oh, there's a really good, dang it. Um, Portugal SQL Server uh, encryption video. Oh, this is going to drive me crazy. Uh, oh, that's it. Oh, no, that's not it. Um, oh, it's going to drive me crazy not knowing that, but I'm, of course I'm not going to find it uh, on uh, quickly. Um, but there's this, there's a great video from a guy out of Portugal, Andre, Andre, Andre Batista, Andre, it's not Andre Batista, Andre, oh man, there's a, a big guy from out of Portugal who talks about sniffing the network connections between them and even modifying the packets. Um, so if you want, it's not that, but uh, if you want to learn more about it, that's the kind of thing that I would go and search for. Uh, next up, let's see, TZ Coder. Uh, Lowell, how are you? Are so skinny? I am not that skinny. I am uh, sadly, <laughs> I am uh, sadly not that skinny. Uh, as my wife will happily tell you that she has to kind of keep me uh, reined in very much in terms of food. Uh, Sachs says, uh, SQL conversations, what can cause a conversation to error? I'm not sure if you mean service broker or what you mean there. Um, I don't actually use service broker at all. So if that's about service broker, I can't help you there. Uh, and then we'll take one more. Roman says, have you ever seen undesirable consequences on the primary enabling readable secondaries? Yes. Andre Melancia. That's it. That's it. That's it right there. Um, so all, all Andre Melancia, if you search for Andre Melancia group by, he has a SQL server, uh, a video on that exact thing. Nice catch there, Lona. And it's early enough, exactly, you got it. Um, so the, the undesirable consequences of enabling a readable secondary. So I'm going to go through a few, because there are a few. The one that I hit the most often is people will take a sync secondary, a synchronous secondary that has to stay up to date with the primary. They'll enable that to be readable, and then they'll throw a bunch of crappy workloads at it, like a bunch of ugly readable reports. 
and then the secondary will slow down to the point where it affects the primary's performance. That is by far and away the biggest one that I run into, that people think that they can just enable reports on a sync secondary without affecting performance, and it does. So I will generally tell people that if you want a, a reporting secondary, it should be async so that we don't have to worry about the overhead on the primary. Another one that I hit all the time, and you nailed that with isolation levels, is that people who want a schema stability lock on the secondary can actually, so if they're reading a table, that structure of that table can't change. The table has to say, have the same number of columns in it. Well, if somebody wants to do a deployment on the primary and they want to change the structure of the table, Blocking on the secondary can actually stop the activity on the primary, can cause blocking on the primary. Um, so those are uh, two common instances that it runs into, so that's a good starting point there. All right, uh, 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 Sal or Saik says, where did you get your shirt from? That's from the Spy Museum in uh, Washington, D.C. Love the Spy Museum, and they use SQL Server. That's all I'm allowed to say about that. Um, so thanks, everybody, for hanging out with me this week. I hope you had uh, fun. I'll do the same thing again tomorrow, actually. Uh, so anything that I didn't get to today, feel free to ask it again tomorrow, and I will go through there uh, through the stream tomorrow. So thanks, everyone, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Adios. <laughs>